On April 30th, I think that's about 11 weeks ago, it was my pleasure and great privilege to be here with you and with great hope of bringing encouragement, really, as we think about the work, the good works that God has prepared us for as Christians. And what happened was as I prepared for that time and I was excited, uh, there were things that I wasn't able to say that day. Um, So because of the sake of time, I had to leave those off. So today I'm excited to get to share some of the things that were left off then. And and then additionally, last week, our, our wonderful pastor gave us six characteristics of a fearless disciple. And, and this, too, was uh, connected to our work because as disciples, we know um, we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. We were created for good works that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, as we considered before, the place that we have to do our work, our workplace, is, uh, is a hostile environment. Um, we talked a lot about, at that time, the problems uh, that exist in the place that we're in, and it's attempting, it's very tempting to kind of feel as though it, uh, the world is worse than it's ever been before. But we said the problem is sin, and that it's not new, it's as old as time. So we looked at our work uh, in two different ways. You remember we had uh, internal work, which was walking by the Spirit, or being filled with the Spirit, being filled with His Word, uh, having the Word dwelling in us, surrendering to it, Right? So that we're being controlled by the word. Uh, literally working to understand what the word says and what it means so that we can go and be doers of the word. Right? We remember. The idea, these precious words being in Christ, we know that we have the freedom to be able to obey the word. As we confess our sin, as we surrender to his word, he fills us and ultimately he's glorified through us. Right? We said that this work is to be ambassadors for the King Jesus. We said that we have a a ministry of reconciliation. And you might remember 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, it says, I think we have it. I hope we have it. Yeah. Uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away and behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, there it is, the ministry of reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them. And he committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us He says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is amazing. Christ through us is begging sinners to be reconciled to himself. It's important, we remember then and we need to remember now, saving people is not our job. That's not our job. God alone can save, but he is a God that saves. But we are to build relational bridges to trade truth upon, the truth of the gospel. We're to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, the power unto salvation, that Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners, the the uncreated creator of the universe. And we're to warn people, remember, the judgment of the day of Yahweh, and it's coming. But we've all, each one of us have been called to preach. Sometimes that's confusing. We think that's the preacher's job. But no, each one of us have been called to preach. And you remember we read, and we'll read again, Romans 10, 11 through 15 says, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved how then will they call on him who they have not believed and how will they believe in him whom they've not heard and how will they hear without a preacher and how will they preach unless they are sent just as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things 
So, again, we were made for work. And we were placed in this time and in, in this area geographically. And even, think of it, even the vilest of sinners among us is our mission field. It was good to clarify. It's always good to remember we're missionaries. We may be, hopefully, some of us will be sent to faraway places, right? But that doesn't always happen. And so it would be a misunderstanding to think that until we go, we're missionaries. But where we are is our mission field. You, you think about it, the eternal beings that are around you everywhere you go, these people will go on forever. That's our mission field. Our family, our friends, our coworkers, our children, neighbors, classmates, people in this church, even our enemies. We should be able to evaluate if they don't know Christ, if people that around us don't know Christ, then we should be ministering reconciliation to them, right? This is just, re we're just rehashing. This is what we said last time. However, as we do this work, right, we find ourselves kind of in a hostile environment and it's a little hard to measure our success. You know, when we share the gospel, it doesn't always end up in a result of people lined up down our street just so thankful to know us and, and uh, wanting to follow Jesus with us, does it? It doesn't work out that way. So it's a little hard to, uh, to be able to measure our success. And you know, our enemy, he wants us to be filled with discouragement and distraction and doubt. And this is why our pastor last week reminded us uh, so well that we are at war. We're at war. And as such, I want to continue uh, considering our work from this perspective. Uh, he mentioned uh, last week that we're to be fearless disciples. And remember, he showed us six ways. He said, the fearless disciple submits to the lordship of Christ, fears God more than man, publicly, publicly confesses Christ, values Christ more than family, values Christ more than life, values eternal, not temporal reward. And he asked us some hard questions. Do you remember? One of them was, he said, hey, the more that you become like Christ, the more the world will hate you. The more the world hates us. He said, are, are you up to that? He said, are we willing to sacrifice ourselves for Jesus? These are hard questions. They make us uncomfortable. And if we're honest, we don't know how we would respond. Here's a short quote from Pastor's newest book, Warrior Preachers. He's... He's uh, used or gotten, uh, gotten one of my best friends, Joel, who was a former Green Beret, to help him to communicate uh, through this book some of the ways that uh, the Christian life are similar to war. And I really appreciated this quote from Joel. It says, uh, the first time I was in combat zone was at the peak of the insurgency in Iraq and U.S. forces were sustaining about 150 attacks each day, he said. Just in Anbar province, Anbar province where I was located in Ramadi. And he says this, I didn't know what to expect and neither did I know how I'd respond. I really love, I mean, you understand, Green Berets, they're like the baddest of them all. They're trained, they, they're, they're not scared. At least they give that communication. They, they would, they just, kind of emit that. I'm not scared. But I love his humble willingness to be transparent about a truth that's likely true of each of us. We really don't know in the face of persecution uh, how we'll respond. Well, I want to share more from his very helpful perspective in a little bit. Um, but this, this preacher, or warrior preacher's book that Pastor's written and his sermon from last week uh, these are such great examples, really, of the way that we have such wonderful care 
through uh, the great shepherd uh, given to us through our pastor Dave. Um, He's constantly looking at the dangers around us. We hear about them week after week. And he's leading us to the the immense provisions in the word that we've already been giving for the battles that we have that we're facing. And thinking on this wartime perspective in the book Warrior Preachers, uh, Pastor has encouraged us to be on the lookout for the tactics of the enemy. And so I've got an excerpt here that I'd like for you to read along with me um, a little bit of it. It'll be helpful for us this morning. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, Ephesians 6, 10, and 11. This warning brings clarity to the primary tactic of the enemy, the schemes of the devil. The term schemes speaks of clever, cunning, crafty deception, typical of a wild animal stalking its prey. Like a lion on the prowl, this predatory uh, predatory enemy lurks in the shadows of a church, studies the moral and spiritual weaknesses of its leaders, and determines the best course of action for a successful ambush, and then, when it is least expected, he strikes with deadly force. The apostle Peter experienced this firsthand on several occasions. Because of this, he warned, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him, firm in your faith. Similarly, Paul warned the saints at Corinth to guard against anything that might produce disunity in the church so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan. For if we're not ignorant of his schemes, or it says, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. The term advantage speaks of exploitation. Like a greedy merchant that looks for every opportunity to beguile and deceive an unsuspecting consumer. Unfortunately, this is where most pastors and church leaders fail badly. In their overconfidence, they feel invincible rather than vincible. They lose focus and fail to remain constantly vigilant against cunning stratagems that target them specifically. My Green Beret brother told me how their training involved seemingly endless surprise and enemy attack scenarios from every imaginable vector. A child on a crowded street approaching you with a grenade hidden in his or her clothing. IEDs hidden in what would appear to be a child wrapped in a blanket being cared for by a weeping mother in need. Or one concealed in a dead donkey in the road that needed to be removed or two men pretending to attack a woman in order to distract the soldiers long enough to allow the enemy to gain the advantage in a surprise attack, or an apparent rock slide on a road forcing their vehicle to slow down and take a slight detour into an ambush. The point of the training was simple, stay alert. He said most special forces fatalities occur at the beginning and at the end of deployment. At the beginning of the deployment, some can feel bulletproof and brash, excessively proud of their elite status, but they have no actual combat experience and are therefore not fully prepared mentally for the dangers around them. He made a statement in this regard that I'll never forget. He said, overconfidence and lack of focus is what gets them killed. He went on to add, the same dynamics could be at play with soldiers ready to go home after a long deployment. Resting on the laurels of their successes can breed apathy and carelessness, causing them to make their mind, uh, take their mind off the mission as they blissfully contemplate their return home. Well, it's my strong desire to encourage our hearts by considering 1 Peter in chapter four this morning, as we've read earlier, we would see our need to prepare now. Now's the time. And that we'd be very comforted, very comforted by the word and the glorious provisions that the Lord has given us by making it perfectly clear what to expect and how to respond. I think it's easy for us to see the mounting hatred for Christians in our culture is like a dark storm cloud heading right for us. You can see it, it's coming. And like the vivid picture that we just read about of the soldiers at the beginning and the end of deployment, we should be on guard for unpreparedness as well as overconfidence and apathy. 
So if you would turn to 1 Peter chapter 4, or we have it here if you want to just read along. And again, in thinking about the good works that God's prepared for us to walk in, we've seen kind of as a running total, we, we looked at the internal works, okay? Uh, being filled with the Spirit and controlled by the Spirit, surrendered to His Word. Uh, we've seen uh, external works that were to be ministers of reconciliation, taking the gospel to our mission field. And again, today, we're going to look at the consequence of doing those things, of being a, a Spirit-filled minister of reconciliation, the consequence or if you want to say the measure of success, is promised suffering. We're going to look at that. So in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose. Like the old preacher joke, uh, now let's see what the therefore is there for. Right? So we've got to look back. You see it? It's referring to Christ's triumphant suffering and death in 1 Peter 3.18. So we'll just look there really quickly. It says in 3.18, For Christ also died for the sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same purpose. Let's think on this. Arm yourself. That's good. Sounds like we're getting ready for a fight. The fight is coming. An arm, we like this in this church especially, that means we get weapons. Okay? This is good. But what is the weapon here? What are we talking about? Bazookas? No. It's the same purpose. Arm yourself with the same purpose. Well, what does that mean? We need to purpose in our heart to suffer in persecution, and not just suffer, but to do it like Jesus, to suffer triumphantly, right? And I think this is about our attitude. This is an attitude. I laugh. It's it's kind of funny. We can easily see uh, attitude issues. If you have kids, um, it's amazing. You, you can, it's, it's actually a little funny, but you can see if a kid wants to do something and there's no stopping them, they can do it. They come up with genius. It's amazing. But if they don't want to do something, I mean, this is where the real genius comes out, right? Um, and it's just attitude. I would like to point out it's not, it's not as funny when you realize that it's the same in their parents, right? <laughs> We can do a lot of things because we want to, but as soon as we don't want to do something because of our attitude, there's no end to the ways out. But understand, it's not saying to seek out persecution. We shouldn't run out of here today and try to go get persecuted. Um, But that if, or maybe better, when persecution comes our way, we need to have the intention. We need to be intent on it, to be triumphant, in it we need to have a desire to be prepared to be triumphant I have a feeling that this as I think about my own heart perhaps some of yours uh, I have a feeling that this would require us to really think about change um, to consider this matter and prayerfully consider major change with our thinking let me ask you and know this I'm asking myself this too Are you prepared to suffer for Christ? Is that your goal? Are you ready for that? The Lord wants us to be ready, and he's saying, arm yourself. Arm yourself with this purpose. Not just to suffer, but to suffer triumphantly. I want to look at how and why in a little bit. Um, but first, I want to camp here for a minute and just take in the beautiful gift that, that God, our King Jesus, has given us in his word. And it's, it's sweet comfort. He, he, he wants us to know um, that he said these things. He, he wants us not to worry, not to be ashamed when this type of thing comes upon us. And he's, he's helping us immensely, really, by proving again that he's omnipotent. 
and omnipresent and he's an omniscient God. He's worthy of our trust. And what could seem like a terrible you know, coming circumstance is actually a gift. I just don't know that we always look at it that way. Um, so I'm going to use 1 Peter chapter 4, but over in 12, verses 12 through 19 to help us kind of point out four attitudes that will help us endure persecution triumphantly. Okay? Four attitudes that will help us endure persecution triumphantly. One, we should expect it. Two, rejoice in it. Three, evaluate its cause. And four, entrust it to God. So first, we should expect it. Look at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. So we, we should not be alarmed if we find ourselves into persecution. Philippians 1, 27 through 29 says, only conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, verse 28, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. In 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10, it says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may or also may be manifested in our body. And look at 2 Corinthians 6, 3 through 10, giving no cause for offense in anything so that the ministry will not be discredited, but in everything commending ourselves as servants of God in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleep, in hunger, in purity, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in, Holy, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold, we live, as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. And I like this. One commentator said this, like Paul, any believer who engages in faithful ministry of reconciliation should expect to be rejected and accepted, to be hated and loved, to encounter joy and hardship. In the second part of the verse 12, it says, and it's not as if some of strange thing is happening. I mean, this is clear to us. God is sovereign. If we find ourselves, or maybe when we find ourselves in persecution, it's not taking him by surprise. It's not some random act that he's not aware of. Think on Romans 8.28. We love this passage, right? And we know that God causes all things to work together for those who love God, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And of course, Philippians 1, 6, we love, for I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
He's at work in these things. He's causing them to work together. He promised that. He began the good work and he's completing it. These are the very things. God is sovereign. And if there's any way that you're unsure or if you just want to have a really good time this afternoon, go, go again and read Job 38, 39, 40, and 41. It's, it says it so loud and clear. But here we are. We must expect We must expect it, and secondly, we must rejoice in our suffering. We must rejoice in it. Verse 13 says, but to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so uh, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you we are to rejoice. Think about Philippians 3, 7 through 14. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained it, that I've already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but the one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're to have fellowship in his sufferings. We can rejoice because it's a proof of the work that he's begun in us. And it's a blessing. Look at Luke 22, uh, I'm sorry, 6, verses 22 and 23. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and insult you and scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. And in Matthew 5, 10 through 16, it says the same thing. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all things of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? If it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Hear it. Hear this. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Here's why we can rejoice in it. Because in these things, we're being used to glorify God. This is the reason we were made. Our ultimate purpose, to glorify God through our good works. And this is lumped in with all those other things that we like better than this. <laughs> okay, James 1, 2 through 4 says, consider it all joy. We're still on the path of rejoicing. Rejoice, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing what? That the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result, that you be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing, right? We can rejoice because he's making us like Jesus, perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. And because we'll receive a crown of life, it says in verse 12 there in James 1, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And just for our everyday use, let's throw in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 19. 
I don't know. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in a few circumstances. No. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And, catch it, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Well, here in this verse, it also says that we're blessed because the spirit of glory and God, the spirit of glory and of God rests on us. Look at 14. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. You know, it occurs to me, Stephen in Acts chapter six is a perfect example of this. We see in chapter six, eight through seven, verse 60, it's a lot of verses, we won't read that today, um, that Stephen, um, it says, is filled with the Holy Spirit. That's good, we wanna be like Stephen. Um, and he's seeking, uh, speaking in that moment to his persecutors, and we see something fascinating. For a lot of space, it's just the word. He gives them a history lesson, the word is just pouring out of this man. He was ministering reconciliation to them. And it was clearly done in love. You can see by the text. But as their sin was exposed, here's how they responded. This is in Acts 7, 54 through 60. He says, now when they had heard this, they were cut to the quick. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. It's not a natural response that we're not, we don't have that in us on our own. This is not the strength of man. This is a man who knew he was weak and he had prepared. He had the word richly dwelling in him. So when the time came, he testified to what he had seen and known and he he ministered reconciliation to these people and they killed him. When we are aware of how how weak we are on our own and we depend upon the spirit, um, we too can be strong in ways that we, we've never seen in ourselves before. But we can certainly understand what Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 12, seven through 10. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. And concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he had said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, therefore I'll rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses and insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. All right, so we must expect suffering and read Rejoice in it. And thirdly, we need to evaluate its cause. Look at verses 15 uh, through 18. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or a thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Well, we need to make sure we're suffering for the right reasons. There's some notes here from one commentator that I want to read on this. It's very helpful. On the words troublesome meddler, 
It says, someone who intrudes into matters that don't belong or that belong to someone else. Peter is dealing with matters that would lead to persecution, such as getting involved um, with in revolutionary disruptive activity or in interfering uh, in the function and flow of government. He says it might also refer to being tr a troublesome meddler in the workplace. As a general rule, Christians, uh, or Christian, a Christian living in a non-Christian culture is to do his work faithfully, exalt, uh, exalt Christ, and live a virtuous life rather than try to overturn or disrupt his culture. And I think as we're being controlled by his word, we'll be careful how we conduct ourselves, right? Here's some examples. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 12 through 16. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men, act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. I think it's a quick note just to say the judgment here is referring to the purging of the church and the chastening of those whom he loves. Um, this is a sanctifying work of God in a believer's life. And again, he causes all things to work together for our good. But as it says, if this is hard for those who he loves, how much harder will it be for his enemies? So we expect persecution. We rejoice in it. We evaluate the cause. And fourthly, we entrust it to God. Verse 19 says, therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. To entrust it. This is a, a banking term. Uh, it means to deposit something for safekeeping. And we see this in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7 through 12, right, right here. Check this out. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted to us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed in. I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him unto that day. And we see in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, for you have been called for this very purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin or was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept on entrusting himself to him who judges rightly. And of course, as we've already read in, in James 1, 12, uh, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial for once he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which has been promised to those who love him. We, we entrust him. Uh, certainly we see the greatest example of trust in Christ. You remember the garden of Gethsemane, he, the night before his crucifixion, he's bleeding, he, he's bleeding out, he's sweating drops of blood. He says to the Father in prayer, Father, if it be possible, take away this cup of wrath. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. This is our example. So in order to suffer and, or to endure persecution and suffer triumphantly, we need to expect it, rejoice in it, evaluate its cause 
and entrust it to God. Now let's look back at verse one of Peter, 1 Peter chapter four. As we've said, we should arm ourselves with purpose, purposeful suffering. Now, as I've thought on this, uh, I realize this is, a, this is quite a challenge for us. Each one of us has spent most of our lives doing everything we can to avoid pain, right? Pain is a good teacher. Our, our children, we, we give them little spankings, right, to help them learn from a little bit of pain to avoid a lot of bit of pain by just this repeated action of sin, right? And we have a whole system, a nervous system that helps us. You know, if I grab a pan, I've done this recently, you can imagine me reaching down and grabbing a nice pan, 400 degrees, what happens? Immediately, my hand recoils, I pull it back. My body knows to do that. I didn't have to think it over. And it's built into our system. I mean, you've seen it. If something flies at your face at like, let's say Mach 3, somehow your eye still manages to be just a smidge faster. That's amazing. It's built into us. And as a dad, I mean, this is hilarious to me. Like my, half of my job as a dad is going, I wouldn't do that. That's gonna hurt. You know, I've become, unfortunately, like a risk assessor for an insurance company. And I mean, I hear the door open and I kinda, at this point, I just mumble half-heartedly like, put your shoes on. I know they're not gonna do it. Uh, I'll just buy them as many shoes as they want. And, and for whatever reason, these people, I love them, but they've come up with more ways to turn a pinky toe into hamburger meat than you can imagine. It's the craziest thing. I'm a killjoy at our house. It's like, don't do that, it'll hurt. Like, it's amazing. But the point is, is we avoid pain. We don't wanna see other people hurting. We don't wanna hurt. We hate it. So why would we do this? Why would we work on an attitude uh, that's purposeful and suffering. Well, one, because the Lord says to, but here in verse one, we see the big because. It says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That sounds good. I wanna know more about that. He who has suffered is, uh, in the flesh has ceased from sin. This is good motivation. Again, uh, let me just share some notes that helped me so much with understanding this. These few words, has ceased from sin. It says the perfect tense of the verb emphasizes a permanent, eternal condition free from sin. So get this. The worst that can happen to a believer suffering unjustly is death. And that's the, that is the best that can happen because death means complete and final end to all sins. If the Christian is armed with the goal of being delivered from sin, which we should be, I mean, can you wait? I can't wait oh, to never sin again. He says, if the Christian is armed with the goal of being delivered from sin and the goal is achieved through his death, then the threat and the experience of death is precious. Moreover, the greatest weapon that the enemy has against the Christian, which is the threat of death, is not effective. Death, where's your sting? Look at this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. <laughs> I can't wait to be free from sin. I can't wait to see my maker face to face. To worship rightly, fully. To love him perfectly. We sing more love to thee because we want to. It doesn't always come out that way. Oh, can you imagine? We arm ourselves with an attitude of joyful submission to a sovereign God. He knows the time. And, and it occurs to me, as I thought about this, it made me laugh. It'd be like somebody inviting you to a knife fight and you go down there with a nuclear weapon. Uh, it's a no-lose situation. You cannot lose. Uh, look at 1 Peter 5. Um, through, uh, we're going to look at verses 6 through 11. It's kind of this summary thought. Therefore... Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but resist him. 
firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to eternal, his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now is the time to prepare. So very practically, just for a few minutes, if you'll just indulge me, um, I, want to give, I want to give myself, I want to give us all this very practical reality, something, a way to lock this down, to think about it. Here's another excerpt from the warrior preachers to help us uh, think on a very practical way uh, to be uh, ready for battle, to be strong and, and courageous, okay? And if you, if you can imagine, too, that there's a little part of me that kind of, uh, over the years, I've been here a long time, there's been days where when another guy gets up to preach, I'm like, I love this man, but I'm working on a bad attitude right now. I want to see my pastor, okay? So I figured out a way to make us all happy. Um, that's not a great attitude that I had, by the way. I've worked through that. But uh, also, I've let him, I want to let him speak to us a little here through his book. So we're all happy now, okay? Um, but I've made it easy so you can read along if you like that or if you just want to listen, that's fine. Um, but listen to what he says here. We can find great comfort in knowing there's nothing that can thwart his sovereign purposes to build his church and to bring glory to himself. Despite even our fears and failures, what he expects of us is to be faithful and obedient warriors who rely solely on his power to accomplish only what he can do in and through us. We see this most dramatically in God's instruction to Joshua when the mantle of leadership was given to him after the death of Moses. And he received his military commission for the bloody conquest of Canaan. His marching orders must be ours as well. Here's what God commanded Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land of which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law of Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1, 6 through 9. While we are not commissioned to exterminate the wicked militarily or in any way take revenge upon them, We are commissioned to make disciples through the preaching of the gospel. To accomplish such an arduous mission in Satan's kingdom of darkness requires our utmost exertion and in faith and godliness. But fortitude alone is insufficient. Our strength and courage is only found in the Lord uh, who has promised, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The same promise he made to Joshua, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you should go. And like the Lord's instruction to Joshua, the key to being strong and courageous is to be saturated with the word of God and be obedient to it. Is to be saturated with the word of God and to be obedient to it. We must be careful to obey all the law and avoid any deviation from it, neither to the right or to the left. This is is what informs our conscience and instructs our mind. This is what it means to walk by the Spirit so we'll not carry out the desires of the flesh and bear the fruit of the Spirit. Moreover, like Joshua, we are commanded to meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. The importance of meditating upon the Word of God cannot be overestimated, though it is foreign to most Christian leaders by their own admission. To meditate on the law of God is to pensively reflect upon the realities of divine revelation so intently that they bring conviction, repentance, encouragement, courage, and soul-satisfying joy in Christ. The man that desires God above all else will fill his mind with holy musings of Christ's infinite perfections, love, and promises. Grace and glory will dominate his heart. His life will be ruled By the word of God, the unsearchable riches of Christ will be the constant topic of his conversations. For indeed, the book of the law will not depart from his mouth. The inferior pleasures of this world, as enticing as they can be, will increasingly lose their appeal. And he says, this is the blessed man whose 
delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. You must never forget that success is conditioned upon courage through obedience. These virtues grow strong in a rich soil of meditation. The godly Puritan warrior of the faith, Thomas Manton, described it this way. Meditation is when we exercise ourselves in the doctrine of of the word uh, and consider how truths known may be useful to us. An act of knowledge reiterated or a return to the mind to that point in which it arrived before, it is inculcation or wedding of a known truth. The pause of reason on something already conceived or known or calling to remembrance what we know before. Listen to this, so good. The end of study is information, but the end of meditation is practice or a work upon the affections. The fruit of study is to hoard up the truth, but the fruit of meditation is to practice it. The warrior preacher, I think that's all of us, by the way, will find his greatest joy in relationship with Christ, an intimacy that will nourish his soul and strengthen his resolve to carry on the fight. And only then will he be strong and courageous. Only then will he not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And he says this, perhaps the testimony of our Green Beret brother Joel C. will once again provide some helpful parallels between the combat physical and the spiritual combat as they relate to the warrior's mindset. This is Joel again. You've heard this part already. The first time I was in the combat zone was at the peak of the insurgency in Iraq and the U.S. forces were sustaining about 150 attacks each day just in the Anbar province where I was located in Ramadi. I didn't know what to expect, neither did I know how I'd respond. I had my iPod, which contained music and sermons I listened to on deployment, and on the, mu- on the back was inscribed, the battle is the Lord's. One of my favorite quotes and scenes in the Old Testament where David ran toward Goliath because he knew that the battle is the Lord's and he totally trusted him. Rockets and mortars were raining down on our little fire base in the middle of Ramadi regularly. Rounds were launched at us a minimum five times per day. Some men on the compound were afraid and didn't want to be caught out in the open, especially after prayers. The attacks seemed to fall just after each call to prayer, which could be heard over multiple loudspeakers and multiple mosques around the city. I remember lying in bed one night listening to a sermon on my iPod. I heard the call to prayer begin and I knew it was just a matter of time before our enemies would start the indirect fire toward our little base. I just turned up my headphones and ignored it. Suddenly, I felt the ground shake and felt a hurt and heard an explosion of the first probably of four or five rockets and I thought, "Wow, that was really close." I thought to myself that I would probably walk the next they would walk the next round in closer. And I prayed and the only thought that I had was, "Lord, you trace the path for lightning bolts." And these rockets are not out of your control. I trust you. I felt peace and I didn't even move from where I was lying on my cot and my tent. It was not like the band of brothers where one of the brave officers said to the cowardly soldier, you know what your problem is? You have hope that you're going to live. You just have to know that you've already, you're already dead and then you can be at peace and operate as a soldier like you should. He said, maybe that's how an unbeliever thinks but not a child of God. It wasn't just a being resolved to die. It was a living trust that I served a sovereign God who controlled all things, even the seemingly random rockets and mortars of our enemies. That was the settled peace and contentment that carried me through every close call or mission thereafter. I was abiding in the Lord and reliant on him, my God, and not anything else. I was walking with my Savior and knew the worst case scenario was that he would call me home. I trusted him with that as well and knew that if he did take me, no training or self-conjured courage would help. I was in his hands. On the other hand, if it was not my time to go, I would be invincible to my enemies. That was the sole basis of my courage during all my deployments. Because of that abiding belief, I volunteered for things that had to be done but others didn't want to do because they were so risky. I wasn't careless. I just knew I could trust my God and Savior with my life or with my death. Real courage comes only from a full knowledge of God. 
uh, from the full knowledge of who God is and total resting in him. It's not reckless or indifferent. It is totally or based solely in him. I'm not brave. I disagree with that, by the way. He's my friend. I know it. Um, I'm not brave, he says, or courageous, but I know the Lord and trust him completely, and I know him through his word alone. I'm very thankful for his testimony there. It helps me. So we've been made for works. We're ministers of reconciliation. As we do our work, we'll be hated and we'll suffer persecution. But we have what we need to be strong and courageous. And like Pastor said, tiny excerpt here, the key to being strong and courageous is to be saturated with the word of God and to be obedient to it. We must be careful to obey all the law and avoid any deviation from it, neither to the right or to the left. He said, this is what informs our conscience and instructs our mind and animates our will and generates our emotions. He says, this is what it means to walk by the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit. So, family, this is the time to prepare. Now's the time to practice. Now's the time to meditate on the Word and be filled with it, be controlled by it. Let me pray for us. Now, Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for helping us to see what maybe we should expect, but also how we should respond. Thank you that you've given us a moment to see. I I know so many people here are prepared. I know that. But perhaps there's some here that aren't. Lord, help, help us. Help us to love your word way more than all else. We know that as we're controlled by your word, God, that you will lead us to say and do and be all that you want us to say, do and be. And since you haven't come to take us away from this place yet, that means you have us here for a reason. So would you help us, God, to see our mission field and to see the need for us to understand our weakness and to find our strength in you by abiding with you. you you've redeemed us, Lord, from that broken place that where we, we pursued the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes and the boastful pride of life. We thought we were God. You've redeemed us from that. And so now we can run with you. We're we're super conquerors because greater is he, you, God, who are in us than he who's in the world. So would you just give us eyes to see and wisdom? And Lord, would you help us to love you and your word and make the most of our time for these days surely are evil. We pray all this in your wonderful name. Amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to the teaching ministry of Calvary Bible Church in Jolton, Tennessee. For more information on Calvary Bible Church or for more audio, please visit our website at cbctn.org.